Hi everybody, this is the biggie right here. We all know that examiners want you to apply and in macroeconomics in particular, they're wanting to use UK examples, quoting data, quoting figures, so that you can back up your points, you can evaluate strongly, you can make good judgments. It's an expectation. So this video here, make sure you write everything down, make sure you memorize this. This is gold dust, this is A star stuff for your exams, huge. Take it all in guys, we're going to start with economic growth. The annual growth rate in the UK economy, that's growth from Q1 of 2017 through to quarter one of 2018, stands at only 1.2%. That's quite a low figure, driven by a very low growth figure for growth in quarter one of 2018 of only 0.1%. And it's very easy to blame the bad weather for that slowdown in growth of Q1 this year. But there are underlying reasons why growth is slowing down in the UK. Very low consumer confidence and very poor business confidence are major drivers. Why? Because of Brexit uncertainty. That's holding back consumer spending, that's holding back business investment. These are the two big drivers. Add to that, we still have austerity policies. Add to that, we have a recent strengthening of the pound, especially to the dollar. All of these reasons holding back growth, but especially the big falls in consumer and business confidence there. Forecast annual growth rates by the OBR is still quite bullish though. If you look at forecast growth for this year, 1.5%. For next year, 1.3%. For the year after, 1.3%. Uh, for 2021, 1.4%. 2022, 1.5% year. So you can see that forecast growth rates are still bullish, but bear in mind these were made before we saw this shock growth figure of Q1 this year. So these could be revised downwards. What's very interesting to know, though, is that the OBR estimate that we are currently sitting with a positive output gap size at 0.3% of GDP. Incredible there. Remember what a positive output gap is. It's when actual growth is greater than potential growth, i.e. long-run growth. Incredible, because if we're forecast to grow at 1.5% and we're sitting with a positive output gap, that tells you that long-run growth in the UK is now around the 1.5 percentage points mark. Why is that important? Well, because our long-run trend rate of growth is a rate of growth whereby we're not going to see much inflationary pressure alongside it. Growth rate slightly beyond that, that's when we start to see demand pull inflationary pressure. So basically, long run, all we can take in terms of growth in the UK economy be before we start seeing demand pull inflation is now only 1.5%. That's our long run trend rate of growth now. That's a very low figure. Before the financial crisis, our long run growth rates in the UK were more like 2, 2.5 two percentage points. So that tells you that since the crisis, our long run growth rates have been decimated. Very poor productivity. Very poor investment are drivers of that. Great for you to know that in an exam. That's powerful stuff right there. Uh, income per head stands at £30,000. Total GDP size of the economy is £2 trillion. How is that made up? Well, 79% of the output that we produce is services, 14% manufacturing, 6% construction, 1% agriculture. That tells you just how unbalanced our economy is, heavily towards services in particular financial services, banking services, legal services, education services, very heavy. No wonder big weaknesses in the pound haven't fed through to significantly higher growth rates because our manufacturing sector is very, very low. Let's look at unemployment now. The UK unemployment rate stands at 4.2%. Mark Carney's estimated that the natural rate of unemployment is 4.25% in the UK. So us having an unemployment rate 4.2 matches the estimate by the OBR of us having a very small positive output gap here. But you've got to be able to critique this figure. That looks very low, that looks very positive. But think about all the people in the UK right now who are underemployed. Those who are working on zero hours contracts but actually don't want to be on those. Those who want to work full time but are only getting part time work. And also graduates who are working in non graduate jobs. Plenty of those people out there. So we can critique this figure by saying, what about the underemployed? They are recorded as fully employed. Is that really the case? Youth unemployment at 11.5%, long-term unemployment, i.e. those unemployed for more than a year, at 1.1%, wage growth at 2.8%, I'll be talking about this more in a bit. Consumer confidence, as I said, very weak. It's been very weak since the Brexit vote. The shock election we had last year has kept it low, and now Brexit uncertainty, because we're close to formally leaving the EU, is also driving very weak consumer confidence right now. Income tax bans, good to know uh, that the tax-free allowance has been raised to £11,850. Um, thereafter, income up to £46,300 will be taxed at 20%. Any income above £46,300 up to £150,000 taxed at 40%. Any income above £150,000 taxed 
of 45%. Let's now look at inflation and the balance of payments. Inflation in the UK economy is currently 2.5%. It's forecast to be 2% by the end of the year, so disinflationary pressure is expected in the UK economy. Um, all of the higher prices caused by the wheat pound are now coming out of the CPI basket. The pound is slightly appreciating against the dollar as well, helping to bring down inflationary pressure. Where is the 2.5% being driven from though at the moment? Well, food price inflation stands at 3%. Oil prices are higher, helping to drive up fuel uh, prices at the pumps. Oil prices were $43 a barrel in 2016. They're now $74 a barrel. So significant increase in oil prices there keeping inflation up slightly beyond target. Core inflation, so that is inflation without fuel prices, without gas electricity prices, without food prices. These three items are very susceptible to price swings and can distort our final inflation figure. So if we feel like this figure is being distorted by any one of those three items, we can look at core inflation to get the underlying price growth in the UK economy. We can see that core inflation is very similar to CPI inflation, so we don't see any distortion by these three different items here. Producer price inflation is also very interesting. This is uh, known as factory gate inflation, measuring the rate of price growth of goods as they leave the factory, i.e. wholesale price inflation. And this is a very good future indicator of CPI inflation, because CPI measures prices of retail goods and services, right? So goods when they enter a shop, whereas wholesale prices are that stage before. So if pr producer price inflation is greater than CPI inflation, it's a future indicator that CPI is going to increase. But we can see at the moment that PPI is actually a little bit lower than CPI, backing up the notion that we are likely to continue to see disinflationary pressure going through this year. Inflation expectations, though, haven't caught up with CPI. Inflation expectations stand at 2.9%, and therefore we can see and we can expect wage growth to remain around the 2.8% level this year. Uh, inflation expectations will drive wage growth and wage bargaining. And that means for the first time in two years, we are going to see real wage increases. Wage growth of around 2.8%, CPI inflation of 25 expected to fall further. Real wage growth. So even though consumer confidence is low, if real wages are rising, we might still see impacts on consumption in the UK. But who knows, consumer confidence really is shot at the moment. Will we see that consumption? That's good evaluation for you. Let's now talk about trade and the balance of payments. The current account deficit we have in the UK is very large at 4.1% of GDP. Uh, and that's driven by a very huge trade deficit, especially our trading goods balance is in a huge deficit. We do have a trade and services surplus. The wheat pound really hasn't helped very much at all here. Uh, productivity and investment are the big reasons why our trade deficit is so large and therefore our current account deficit is so large. Productivity and investment have been very, very poor ever since the financial crisis here. Uh, exchange rates, we are seeing a recovery to the dollar. One pound is currently equal to $1.37. It was around $1.40 before the Brexit vote. So we're seeing a recovery uh, against the dollar, but still very weak against the euro. Before the Brexit vote, one pound used to buy around one euro 30, one euro 31. So at one euro 14, we are still very weak against uh, the euro. The eurozone economy is doing very well. That's driving strength to the euro. Um, the Eurozone economy is forecast to grow at 2.7% this year. That's quite significant forecast growth there. Uh, the US economy also doing very, very well. It's at full employment. Annual growth rate is currently at 2.9%. So our two major trading partners are doing very well. So in that sense, we hope to continue to see a, a bit of a boost in exports there. But no longer a weak pound against the dollar. That's good to know. Let's now move on and talk about government finances and interest rates in the UK. The current UK budget deficit stands at 2.1% of GDP in raw figures, that's £50 billion. That is forecast to fall to 0.9% of GDP by 2021, the continuation of austerity policy there. Having said that, Philip Hammond has left £3 billion to the side in case of a Brexit shock when we leave the European Union. So he's kept that on the side in case we need any fiscal stimulus, expansionary fiscal policy. Uh, if there is a big shock to the economy when we leave the European Union. Our national debt to GDP, so total debt, stands at 86% of GDP here, and that is forecast to fall to 78% of GDP by 2021. Again, continuation of austerity policy and forecast growth rates to be relatively good in the UK economy over this time period. Bond yields, um, this is the uh, average yield on a 10-year government bond, stands at 1.4%. That's important because it means that coupons that governments issue on their bonds can also be quite low, meaning the cost of borrowing for the UK government right now is quite low. 
Income tax plans, we've already gone through those. Uh, corporation tax stands at 19%, but further cuts are expected. Expected to be around 17% in 2020, so expect further cuts there. VAT, currently at 20%. Let's talk a little bit about income inequality. Our Gini coefficient is 0.34. Important to know that since austerity, this figure has actually come down. Uh, however, relative to other countries, especially in the OECD, we are above the average, our Gini coefficient. OECD average is 0.31 here, ours is 0.34. So, relatively wider income inequality compared to other nations in the OECD. Let's not talk about interest rates in the UK. The Bank of England interest rate is 0.5%. The average lending rate is also very low, 1.5%. Average quoted mortgage rate, uh, that's for new house buys on a two-year fixed mortgage here, 1.75%, also quite low there. Consumer confidence and business confidence, very weak as we've said. So even though there are very low interest rates out there, consumer confidence and business confidence being weak might reduce the impact of these low rates feeding through to high growth in the economy. Mortgage, mortgage approvals here, flat growth. So the housing market is pretty stagnant at the moment. Again, Brexit concerns holding back new house buying. Quantitative easing, the total amount of money pumped into the UK economy stands at £435 billion. Just remember that in August 2016, we saw an interest rate cut from 0.5% to 0.25%. Since then, November 2017, we saw that rate rise back to 0.5%. But in August 2016, we saw an extra £60 billion of QE pumped into the UK economy. Hence, the figure is now £435 billion. Very good to know here that the willingness of banks to lend to small and medium enterprises uh, was very, very poor up until 2016, very weak post the financial crisis. Since 2016, there has been a slight improvement that if you speak to small and medium enterprises, they fundamentally disagree. They believe that if they wanted to go to the bank and raise finance to fund any investment, they feel that default, they'll get a rejection from the bank. So they think that uh, lending to them is still very weak. They don't see the bank as a go-to place to go and raise finance. Very important to know that. So that covers all of these key stats. And let's now finish this uh, video, guys, by looking at key supply-side policies in the UK. The UK government is really committed to boosting productivity. We've already talked about how weak productivity is in the UK economy. Um, so a lot of these policies will link to productivity. I've broken the board up into two. On the left-hand side, you can see policies that really try and promote long-term investment. A lot of these are interventionist supply-side policies, government spending heavy. Not all of them, but a lot of them here are. We then will look at more market-based supply-side policies on the right. So let's focus on long-term investment, a lot of these policies to boost productivity. Uh, a very important stat for you to know is that Philip Hammond, the UK government, have committed to spending £31 billion going into this National Productivity Investment Fund. So £31 billion committed for government spending to boost productivity over the next five years going into this special fund. And we can see where this money is going to go in a second when we look at all of these policies. The first policy we'll look at is actually not government spending related. It's a market-based policy here. But corporation tax cuts. Since the Conservatives came into power, corporation tax has been cut by 4%. It was 23% before they took power in 2010. Now stands at 19%. There are plans to cut that further to 17% in 2020. Uh, but now we go into more government spending policies here. Um, so there are policies to encourage more long-term investment. Uh, first, we go down the bottom here. There are subsidies, there's tax relief available for small and medium enterprises who are engaging in research and development. But there is also this investment allowance of £200,000. So the amount of uh, capital investment that businesses can partake in, which they can claim back against their profits, uh, stands at £200,000 here. That's a good little stat for you to know. Uh, the government is very committed in boosting skills in the UK economy. Um, they've raised the income tax free allowance, as we know, currently standing at £11,850. Before the Conservatives took power, that figure was only £6,500. So that's a significant increase since 2010. And there are plans to raise it even further to £12,500 by 2020. Also worth knowing, there are plans to increase the level uh, before we start paying 40% income tax to £50,000. It currently stands at £46,300 plans to increase that to £50,000 again by 2020. These are all, think about it, tax cuts, aren't they? A subtle tax cuts, not direct tax cuts as we know it, but subtle tax cuts to incentivise more people getting into work, getting skills, being trained up, and then getting into work, and also encouraging those who are in work to be more productive, to work harder, knowing that they can keep more of their income as disposable income. 
There is government spending on apprenticeship schemes, apprenticeship funding via this apprenticeship levy that businesses who employ apprentices have to pay. There is also curriculum reform. We know about A-level reform. You guys are currently going through that. There is primary school reform. But there is also a reform in terms of introducing T-levels, technology-based A-levels, to try and diversify skills in the UK economy. There are also subsidies and grants available for adults who want to train, who want to get degrees. Uh, there is more money being uh, given to schools who promote maths and computer science. So more pupils that enroll in maths courses and computer science courses will get uh, greater funding. Um, so good to know that recent uh, implementation of government spending there. What about transport spending? Well, the government is committed to spending £1.7 billion into this Transforming Cities Fund, uh, funded by increases to vehicle excise duty. And that £1.7 billion is going to local councils for infrastructure improvements this year, so that's 2018 to 2019. The government is also committed to rail infrastructure, two massive rail projects, Crossrail and HS2, the two biggest transport infrastructure projects in Europe as we speak here. So they're due to finish very soon, Crossrail due to finish by the end of this year and into next year. Uh, the government is committed to spending £1 billion on digital infrastructure, £176 million for 5G, uh, networks and £200 million for full fibre networks to be rolled out in local areas. So good to know that, to uh, improve Wi-Fi speeds, to have more households having access to super fast Wi-Fi, that clearly boosts productivity. If we look at research, the government is committed uh, to making sure that government spending on research is going to be around 2.4% uh, of the economy size by 2027, so a big commitment on research infrastructure spending here. Let's look at more market-based policies now, market-based supply-side policies. Theresa May is very committed to planning reform, easing planning permission for new homes to be built, increasing the supply of houses, and thus bringing down prices ideally, increasing affordability in the housing market. The Conservative Party have also talked about trying to promote a high pay, low tax, low welfare society. When they say high pay, they always refer to higher economic growth in the past, driving up incomes, but to help those on lower incomes, increasing the national living wage, standing now at £7.83 an hour, that's for those aged above 25 year, years old. For those aged below 25, increasing national minimum wages there as well. We already know about low tax, what about low welfare? Well, the Conservative Party have introduced something called the universal credit benefit here. And that's basically bringing lots of different benefits into one system, to simplify the benefit system and to always encourage work. Whereas before, with all these different benefits that people were claiming, they could claim huge sums and therefore sit on benefits, as opposed to being incentivized to work. So bringing in this one universal credit, where all benefits come into this one uh, type of benefit here, it keeps the incentive to work. You also need to know that benefits have been capped, so the amount that individuals can claim has been capped at a certain level as well which means there is always this incentive to work. This is a means-tested benefit too, so it gradually reduces when you get into work. It doesn't suddenly disappear once you start working. So the incentive to work is always there, not to rely on benefits. Uh, competitive markets, yeah, the Conservative Party are again committed to cutting a lot of red tape. Deregulation here trying to cut 10 billion pounds worth of red tape in the UK economy. Using this one in and three out rule, so for every regulation that's imposed, three need to come out, and also this red tape challenge, so challenging businesses to cut as many burdensome and unnecessary regulations as possible to hit their target here. When it comes to trade in this uh, kind of Brexit era now, the focus is very much on trying to promote more exports and also negotiating trade deals, especially with countries outside the EU, of course with the EU themselves, right? but especially now with countries outside the EU, seeing that as an opportunity uh, for greater trade. And the UK government want to promote more of a balanced economy, away from London dependency and growth being dominated in London. The Northern Powerhouse is the way in which the Conservative Party is trying to do that, launched under George Osborne and still continuing now under Philip Hammond. The Northern Powerhouse really co consists of three major ideas. One, the devolution of powers, so allowing local councils greater power to enact their own policies. So devolution of power away from London towards local councils. Second, to give local councils more funding, certain local councils, more funding to enact those policies up north. Uh, and finally, for local councils really to promote policies that will encourage growth, that will uh, boost infrastructure, that will create jobs up north. So that growth can come more from the north as opposed to coming really solely from London in this country here. That's the idea of the Northern Powerhouse. 
So that guys covers absolutely everything you need to know about the UK economy, all the stats that are up to date as of this video right now. Uh, make sure that you memorize these, these facts, these figures, and also you're aware of all these different supply side policies. This could well get you the A or the A star in your final examination. So use well, powerful stuff here. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you all in the next video.